Now I think we could all agree that a well-balanced diet is a cornerstone to the way that we act and feel on a day-to-day -day basis and is paramount to our long-term health, but have you ever taken into consideration how your nutrition choices either encourage or discourage the wearing and tearing of the discs of the spine? In this episode, a continuation on the talk of degenerative disc changes of the spine, we're going to explore how nutrition actually plays a role in the health of your discs. Furthermore, how you can use nutrition to your advantage to have healthy, happy discs for extended periods of your life. Hey, this is Michael with Total Physical Therapy, and today we are discussing the concept of nutrition, specifically how nutrition plays a critical role in the health of the discs of the spine, furthermore, how nutrition can contribute to degenerative disc problems of the spine. Now, if we're talking about the discs of the spine, we need to first recognize that these are the largest avascular tissue throughout the entire human body. Avascular meaning they do not have a direct blood supply. Now there are a couple key areas in the body with limited blood supplies or no blood supplies and these areas have a limited capacity for healing and the discs are no exception to the rule except for the fact that they obtain their nutrition through a gas exchange through something called an end plate. So if we are going to dig into this a little bit deeper, we need to first get the basic anatomy out of the way. Now before I get too far into the discussion about how nutrition plays a key role in the health of our spinal discs, let's break the anatomy down into a very simple pictorial representation of three key elements that we're going to routinely discuss in this video. Number one, the end plate, the vertebral body, as well as the disc. So in this picture representation, we have a vertebral body, or rather the bone of the spine, separated from another bone by a disc. Every one of these bones in the spine are going to have an end plate. Now an end plate is a thin layer of a combined bone and cartilage matrix that lines the borders on the top as well as the bottom surface of the bone. That is the area of utmost concern when it comes to the nutrition of these discs. Because as I discussed earlier, the discs in the human body are the largest avascular structure in the human body. Avascular meaning they don't have a direct blood supply. Now any tissue in the human body that has a limited or an absence of blood supply has a very uh, low probability and likelihood of healing. In the case of the disc, this would be true if it wasn't for these end plates and our ability to actually exchange nutrients through a gas exchange from the uh, vertebral body or rather the bone right through the end plate on into the discs. So keep this in mind as we go through this discussion. Now you're able to have a reference point between what is occurring when these bones have a very strong uh, vascular supply or rather blood supply that blood supply is supplying the nutrients that not only the bone needs, but that the discs need as well, but they are absorbing those nutrients through this exchange through the end plate. And as I discussed later in the video, complications with the vascular supply and or with these uh, end plate lesions in the human body and sclerotic bone problems which are often accompanied by uh, bony abnormalities of the spine like scoliosis and other conditions. In these conditions we are greatly incapacitating the ability for these gases to exchange between the bone and the discs ultimately leading to complications in the discs. Now the cells of the discs are indeed the architects, the builders, and the maintenance crew for maintaining a healthy environment within the disc. As such, they need the right equipment to get the job done. Without an adequate blood supply to deliver nutrients, they're going to need other mechanisms to deliver the goods. Now let's talk a little bit more about the blood supply. The blood supply to the vertebral area is going to be the major transport mechanism by which we get uh, vitamins and minerals from point A to point B. 
and naturally diseases that affect that blood supply are going to negatively affect the ability to get the nutrients to the bones of the spine as well as into the discs of the spine. So conditions like arterio or atherosclerosis, things like sickle cell anemia and, and other types of uh, blood complications are going to reduce the capacity of the body to exchange those uh, key ingredients from point A to point B. Now repeatedly studies have shown that degenerative changes of the spine, those individuals oftentimes have arterial complications as well, reiterating this concept that uh, the nutrients needed in these areas are highly dependent upon that arterial blood supply. Other factors affecting arterial supply, uh, excessive prolonged exposure to vibration as well as smoking have been shown to reduce these capillary beds found within the Ver vertebral bodies. Now how about the role of those end plates that we discussed earlier? As we mentioned, these serve as the wall allowing that diffusion of gases from the vertebral bodies on into the discs so we can utilize that, that fuel. And conditions that affect that end plate, uh, sclerotic bony lesions such as often found in scoliotic deformities, hypercalcification of the bones of the spine and or breakdown of uh, the end plate itself referred to as a schmoral node these are all going to impede transports of those nutrients from the bone on into the discs now how about the role of aging we know that as we age the density and integrity of the capillary beds reduces throughout the human body thus decreasing blood supplies to those tissues in need this ultimately leads to a decreased density of the disc cells found. Furthermore, we know that a decrease in the bone density of the vertebrae, often found with non-weight-bearing activities, further reduces the capillaries. So if we're going to talk about aging and we're just going to throw out the idea and the notion that because we age, these things are going to occur, we can't discredit the fact that there are things that we can do to combat that reduction uh, in the capillary beds. Now how about the role of weight as it pertains to the health of the discs? Well, it's been consistently shown that an increased BMI is going to increase the chances of degenerative changes of the spine. BMI is the loose calculation that helps identify whether somebody is of appropriate weight, underweight, or overweight. And these studies have consistently shown that as that BMI increases, which means that people would be overweight on into obesity or morbid obesity, these likelihood of these degenerative changes are increasing with that BMI. I think one, uh, one contributing factor to this is, is that we also identify the fact that as BMI goes up, or rather, rather as weight goes up, so does the likelihood of these arterial diseases and these plaquey buildups through the arter arterial walls. Okay, that brings us around to exercise. Now we could talk about this ad nauseum in another video, but what I wanna do here is just bring to light one particular uh, research ar article by Holm and colleagues that explored the effects of nutrient transport relative to exercise. Now what they did was identify the fact that short-term exercise defined as six hours or less had absolutely no effect on the nutrient transport between the vertebral bodies and the discs. However, what they also identified was the fact that long-term exercise identified as exercise persistent for three months or more, meaning you continue to do the same activity for three months or more, had a positive influence on increasing the ability of transportation of those gases from the bone on into the discs. This was secondary to changes in the microcirculation of the capillary beds, all coming back to this idea that blood supply is critical. So the take home with that message is consistency is key. The weakened warriors are not going to get exposure to this microcirculation to increase the ability for these nutrients to be utilized. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about metabolism. Metabolism is simply going to be how the body breaks down our food that we uh, ingest into usable form for specific cells. 
Now, relative to the health of the spinal discs, the discs use something called glycolysis to tear down glucose, or rather sugar molecules, into usable energy, uh, otherwise known as ATP. Now, in this process of breaking down glucose to, to create usable fuel, they also put off a byproduct of that called lactic acid. Now, lactic acid in, throughout the body uh, can and does lower the pH, uh, how basic or acidic our body is at, at a resting state. Furthermore, we know that a reduction in the pH uh, also decreases cell viability in the discs. As such, the spine utilizes a mechanism to not only bring those gases in to use as fuel, but to take the lactic acid and move it out. So there's this continual exchange and this uh, uh, well working relationship between glucose in, lactic acid out in normal healthy individuals. Now, what about in unhealthy individuals? This relationship becomes uh, abnormal. We start to have these reductions in the pH within the, the, within the cells themselves of the discs, and these changes in the relationships encourage cell death. How quickly can it occur? It can actually occur within 24 hours if the pH drops enough. So we also furthermore know that with adequate levels of glucose, but a drop in the pH, we still get that cell death. So not only is it critical to get uh, the right fuel into the discs, but it's equally uh, important to get the acid out of the discs. So in summary, we've recognized that sustained uh, reductions or declines in the quality of nutrition, changes to the end plates of the spine, arterial diseases of all natures, these all contribute to cell death. This cell death appears to affect the nucleus or rather that hard inner core of the disc first. Now the fact that this appears to affect the nucleus is interesting given the fact that around about 45 to 55 years old we see a very sharp uh, increase in the number of bulges of that nucleus propulsus or that hard inner core of the discs. And this could potentially be a result of years of inadequate or poor nutrition supplying those discs ultimately leading to very, very aggressive declines in the structure of those discs. So what are the long-term implications of poor or inadequate nutrition, specifically as it pertains to the discs of the spine? As cells within those discs die at faster rates than which they can rebuild, there are less number of viable cells available to accept supplemental or changes to nutrition. What's the take home with that idea? The take home is to be proactive rather than reactive with your nutrition. Our nutrition, whether it be adequate or inadequate, is a habit. And as such, habits change over months, not days. So don't find yourself struggling to make these changes to your nutrition when you're currently dealing with spine pain or radiating pain uh, into your limbs as a result of spinal complications. You need to start building the habits now to lay a foundation for healthy, happy discs that provide decades of freedom. So we've talked a little bit in depth of some of the mechanisms of this nutrition, how uh, our body actually utilizes this fuel, and, and how that changes in uh, pathologic states. But at the end of the day, the big question is, what do we eat? There's absolutely no one-way approach for every individual that's going to watch this video. But through decades of research in nutrition, there is one consistent method that has held through to the test of time. That is the fact that whole foods, whole grains, plant strong diets are going to be the most opportune uh, nutritional methods to help achieve health of not only these discs but of the entire human body. We recommend that individuals seek out opportunities to buy and use foods that have minimal to no processing and packaging. Look for foods that have short shelf durations. None of this food that has expiration dates two years out. 
basically seek out ways to explore more fruits and vegetables and dishes that otherwise have been limited or you just haven't considered adding an additional uh, fresh produce to that dish. Minimize the added and artificial sugars found in so much food. Control your exposure to saturated fats and be leery of those foods that are considered low fat or reduced fat because often in the absence of these uh, harmful fats, we've introduced more sugars. So I hope that in watching this video, you start to realize that your nutrition is, is a habit that you have established over a long period of time and those habits can be changed just like other habits. So if you find yourself valuing the health of your spine, you've had others around you or family members that have had complications with their spine and you've seen how debilitating they can be, make that change now. If you're one of those individuals that is currently dealing with spinal pain, there is still the ability to make these changes, but you cannot expect them overnight. You're going to have to develop these habits in your nutrition to help supply the necessary fuels and help improve this microcirculation to these tissues to make sure that we get the most out of the food that we eat. If you found this video helpful, please give us a thumbs up, comment down below, share with us your experiences with dealing with nutrition. If you have explored how to introduce more fruits and vegetables, whole foods, whole grains into your diet, and you'd like to share some of those techniques down below, there's thousands of other people that would love to hear those stories so they can in turn introduce some of those same techniques in their own nutrition. Have a great day, guys. We'll talk to you soon.